Sin has a cost. The wages of sin is death. Forgiveness is available. Will God forgive us? Sure. But something or someone must die. Hello and welcome to Crosstalk International. I'm Josh Weiss, and this episode is part six of our ongoing series, God, Forgive Me? It's based on a book by my father, Dr. Randy Weiss. And this series is about the sacrifice that's required to atone for sin. Now we're currently at a point where we're literally talking about the different kinds of sacrifices that were mandated in Old Testament law. It can be confusing at first glance, but stick with us and we'll help you to have a good understanding of it by the end. I'm gonna repeat something that I've said because it's true and needs repeating. Not all sacrifices are created equal. As I declared at the beginning of this conversation, not all sacrifices are created equal, neither are all sins created equal. And we must remember that not all sacrificial offerings are for sins. Bloodshed is not a requirement for thanksgiving or for worship, yet Leviticus describes specific thanksgiving and worship offerings. Now, often grain was used in such circumstances. It's important to identify the distinction that not all uncleanness would be considered a sin. For example, a woman's menstrual cycle would render her ritually impure. Yet no one should suggest that a woman had sinned simply because of her natural, biological monthly cycle. Similarly, childbirth is a blessing from God. Nevertheless, giving birth renders a woman ritually unclean. And Moses instructed us about the various sacrifices that were ordered by God specifically just for such occasions. He said, Speak unto the children of Israel, saying, If a woman be delivered and bear a man-child, then she shall be unclean seven days, as in the days of the impurity of her sickness shall she be unclean. And she shall continue in the blood of purification three and thirty days. She shall touch no hallowed thing, nor come into the sanctuary until the days of her purification be fulfilled. But if she bear a maid child, then she shall be unclean two weeks, as in her impurity, and she shall continue in the blood of purification three score and six days. And when the days of her purification are fulfilled for a son or for a daughter, she shall bring a lamb of the first year for a burnt offering and a young pigeon or a turtle dove for a sin offering unto the door of the tent of meeting unto the priest." and he shall offer it before the Lord, and she shall be cleansed from the fountain of her blood. This is the law for her that bears whether a male or a female. You can read about that in Leviticus chapter 12. Once again, this text reveals God's heart for the poor and proves his compassion to reduce the cost of being made ritually clean. It says, and if her means suffice not for a lamb, then she shall take two turtle doves or two young pigeons, the one for a burnt offering and the other for a sin offering. And the priest shall make atonement for her and she shall be clean. Christian readers may recognize that when Joseph and Mary went to the temple after the time of her purification, she brought the offering of a poor person, two turtle doves. The New Testament says, Now when the days of her purification, according to the law of Moses, were completed, they brought him to Jerusalem to present him to the Lord, as it is written in the law of the Lord. Every male who opens the womb shall be called holy to the Lord, and to offer a sacrifice according to what is said in the law of the Lord, a pair of turtle doves or two young pigeons. That's from the Gospel of Luke, chapter 2. You see, Moses laid out God's plan for man's atonement, in the most unmistakable terms, in the very first chapter of Leviticus. Therein he explained the most basic requirements for a grotesque, yet spiritually and biblically effective burnt offering to be sacrificed by God's people for God to enact a well-pleasing outcome. Sin demands an atoning sacrifice. And I'm going to read it to you just like it's written. You need to know what atonement looked like to God and Moses. 
and he shall lay his hand upon the head of the burnt offering, and it shall be accepted for him to make atonement for him. And he shall kill the bullock before the Lord, and Aaron's sons, the priests, shall present the blood and dash the blood round about against the altar that is at the door of the tent of meeting. And he shall flay the burnt offering and cut it into pieces. And the sons of Aaron, the priests, shall put fire upon the altar and lay wood in order upon the fire. And Aaron's sons, the priests, shall lay the pieces and the head and the suet in order upon the wood that is on the fire which is upon the altar, but its inwards and its legs shall he wash with water, and the priest shall make the whole smoke on the altar for a burnt offering, an offering made by fire of a sweet savor unto the Lord. A more modern reading clarifies the intent of this bloody exercise and identifies the intended outcome of the ritual slaughter and the purpose of the animal's death in place of the death of a person who had sinned. It says it then becomes his substitute. The death of the animal will be accepted by God instead of the death of the man who brings it as the penalty for his sins. That's in the first chapter of Leviticus. Sin has a cost. The wages of sin is death. Forgiveness is available. Will God forgive us? Sure. But something or someone must die. As I've tried to show with graphic descriptions, forgiveness did not exist within biblical Judaism apart from the prescribed biblical sacrifices. God defined the details in the Mosaic Law for ancient Jews so they could obtain forgiveness through the blood sacrifices that God demanded. Likewise, Christianity also came to recognize the biblical need of a sacrifice to atone for sins. Christians interpret the final sacrifice to have been accomplished through Jesus the Messiah. Modern Jews believe that the Book of Life is opened on Rosh Hashanah, and our fate is sealed on Yom Kippur. If that fate is deemed by God to be for hardship and sorrow, Jews hope to change God's mind through fasting and praying. Many believe a simple appeal to God is sufficient to erase one's sins. Perhaps they assume that by refraining from food or drink, they have offered a sufficient sacrifice for their sins. That would be an epic failure according to God's stated requirement of presenting a guilt offering or a sin offering. The Bible leaves no room for ignoring that an atonement is mandatory. It is widely acknowledged that God is merciful, patient, and willing to forgive. However, the Hebrew prophet reminds us that nobody with a guilty verdict against him will escape without punishment. The Bible says the Lord is slow to get angry, but his power is great and he never lets the guilty go unpunished. So, all of us should be desirous of having an atonement made on our behalf to remove our guilt. Another question, what does God say about sacrificial offerings for atonement? Well, the answer is precise. And this is the law of the guilt offering. It is most holy in the place where they kill the burnt offering shall they kill the guilt offering, and the blood thereof shall be dashed against the altar round about. It is a guilt offering. As is the sin offering, so is the guilt offering. There's one law for them, the priest that makes atonement therewith. But what is atonement? I mean, maybe a definition is required. One excellent reference suggests that atonement is the means by which the guilt punishment chain produced by violation of God's will is broken, as well as the resulting state of reconciliation, at one mint with God. For most ancients, violation of the world order led to punishment by divine powers. Only atonement could prevent or end such punishment. The Hebrew Bible viewed a number of offerings and sacrifices as atoning. 
The best known were the elaborate sacrificial priestly rites of atonement developed mainly in the post-exilic period. The rites of atonement were carried out by the high priest through prescribed sacrifices in the temple. For early Judaism, the atonement base was broadened to include the sacrifice of martyrs whose achievements were calculated and deemed meritorious for others. Wait, Jews believed that martyrs could die to atone for the sins of other people? A Jewish martyr for sins? Seriously, one ancient Jewish work considered a special atonement through martyrdom during the intertestamental era, that time between the close of the Hebrew Bible and the revealing of the New Testament. Judaism had been enduring momentous religious and political upheaval. Christianity had not yet blossomed from the root of Judaism. The texts of that era are admittedly not canonical, yet the wisdom and faith-building testimonies contained in the ancient apocryphal and pseudepigraphical writings of pre-Christian Judaism are invaluable. One scholar concludes, it is not too much to say that no modern can intelligently understand the New Testament unless he is acquainted with the so-called apocrypha and with the pseudepigrapha as well. For the purposes of this discussion, consider a text from the century before Jesus that details the testimony of Eliezer the Jew. He was tortured to death by Antiochus Epiphanes during the Syrian persecution. Eliezer was commanded to eat the flesh of swine. He refused to break the Jewish law. At the threat of death, he chose martyrdom over compromise. The text of his moral battle holds one of the most inspiring tales of antiquity. The conclusion reached by the ancient Jewish writer is even more astounding. Eliezer's dying words are reported to be as follows. Thou, O God, knowest that though I might save myself, I am dying by fiery torments for thy law. Be merciful unto thy people, and let our punishment be a satisfaction in their behalf. Make my blood their purification, and take my soul to ransom their souls. That's from the fourth book of Maccabees. When considering the topic of a sacrifice for forgiveness of sin, these words are both powerful and inspirational. But to suggest that Eliezer's death could be salvific in any capacity misses a fundamental concept of sacrifice as understood within biblical Judaism or Christianity. To be accepted as a sacrifice, any animal presented to the priests as a victim to be offered was required to be sacrificially perfect, unblemished. That criteria was non-negotiable. No standard less than an unblemished sacrifice was to be offered to our holy God. There's no suggestion in any writings that Eliezer met that biblical requirement. He was a man. In all likelihood, he was a good man when compared to many men. But nonetheless, he was an imperfect, sin-blemished human being. Therefore, he was disqualified by sin from being an acceptable atonement for other sinners. The literature describing this event is both fascinating and relevant, though not canonical and not normally included in either the Jewish or Protestant Christian Bibles of today. The Apocrypha is valued by Jews as a crucial source of data to understand our history and to study the origins of our Jewish celebrations of Chanukah. By the way, in prior centuries, the Apocrypha was included as a section of most King James Bibles, and it continues to be part of the Catholic Bible. And now I want us to consider some rabbinic traditions, both old and new. I mean, original Judaism. The, the Jewish people of antiquity had a very different view of atonement. Modern Jewish practices ignore the core requirements of God's commands to secure atonement. In this regard, rabbinic Judaism fails to mirror the faith of our forefathers. Perhaps that is why the High Holy Days are altered to the point of being unrecognizable 
when compared to ancient practices. This comment is not intended to downplay the beauty of modern Judaism. Rather, it questions its adequacy. Who gave the rabbis of the early Christian era the right to determine God's standard on sin, sacrifice, or atonement? History reveals they took this authority for themselves. Both Judaism and Christianity are guilty of exalting their own beloved traditions over biblical mandates, but the rabbis have redefined their authority to such a degree that their ability to responsibly interpret the will of God must be questioned. For example, you know, the claims of the ultra-Orthodox rabbis to maintain an unbroken stream of revelation and authority from Moses through the oral law, the Talmud, it's a flawed theory. It's no more credible than the claims of the Pope's infallibility or his own broken connection to Peter. Just as Protestant Christians rejected papal authority throughout rabbinic history, thinking Jews of many flavors have doubted the claims of the rabbis. Opposing views in the past were prevalent. Millions of Karite Jews rejected the final authority of the oral law in antiquity. They believed the, the written Torah was sufficient, and they did not trust their opponents to reinterpret the written law with the new oral law. Opposing views in our time continue to exist in enormous numbers. Consider one Jewish historian and thinker who wrote, through the power of interpretation, the Jews were able to free themselves from laws of the Torah, which they found difficult, unethical, harsh, or unreasonable, but they would rarely admit that they were overturning the sacred text. They would insist that they were merely interpreting it. So you have rabbis of the early Christian era who sought and found a way to do exactly what the previous Jewish authors suggested through interpretation. They freed themselves from laws of the Torah which they found difficult. When questioned, many modern Jews reject the oral law. They realize it does not belong in the canon of Scripture. It's wrong to reinvent the Bible through the opinions of one group of rabbis over another group of rabbis. God's decisions were never intended to be determined by popular vote or, I don't know, according to the favorite rabbinic flavor du jour. This is especially unwise given that many of the rabbis who created the oral law came from a limited stream of Judaism that in many ways clashed with and contradicted other streams of Jewish thought. It's theologically dangerous to have empowered rabbis from numerous generations to own the authority to tailor biblical standards to suit their situations. The Supreme Court tailors the laws of America via interpretation. The Bible is higher and must remain constant. The Constitution was designed with a protocol that allowed it to be changed by men. <laughs> the Bible has no such protocol. God's Word was intended to change men. God does not change, and He has not authorized men to alter His Word. The rabbinic tradition suggests that their respected rabbis are the bearers of a sacred, unwritten tradition revealed to Moses. These rabbis are presumed to be the direct heirs of this divine knowledge passed from God through Moses to the Jewish people. They promote the view that their forebears got it on Mount Sinai, and they have been divinely inspired throughout the generations. The same Jewish historian that I mentioned earlier, he correctly called that tradition a myth by which the rabbis legitimated themselves. Many Reform and conservative Jews would likely agree. So I ask, what happened to the sacrifices? There's no doubt that my people fell into disobedience during biblical times. The exile described in the scriptures bears witness that God responded by bringing violent enemies against us. We oppressed one another. We practiced different forms of idolatry. We refused to submit to the words of God's prophets. I mean, simply put, we failed to conform to Torah, to biblical standards. When our temple was destroyed, we lost our method for obeying 
important requirements of God's law. We lost our ability to maintain the Levitical priesthood, the sacrificial system, and the God-ordained method to obtain forgiveness according to the undeniable direction of Moses. After the ruination of what is called the Second Temple, Herod's Temple, no sacrificial system existed within Judaism. The altar of the temple and the trained Levitical priests disappeared. Christians readily identify that the prophecy of Jesus correctly foretold the temple's destruction by Rome. This event forever changed the face of Judaism shortly after the death of Jesus. The Christian world finds atonement in Him, their sacrificial lamb. Jesus was brilliantly described by the ancient Hebrew prophet Isaiah. He wrote, He was wounded because of our transgressions. He was crushed because of our iniquities. And he goes on to say, And the Lord has made to light on him the iniquity of us all. We're all familiar with his words where he says, As a lamb that is led to the slaughter, this is how our Messiah was described, and this shows a picture of our Messiah, Jesus. Modern Jews are forced to seek atonement in a new tradition without their substitutionary sin-bearer of Scripture. As a result, an odd array of dysfunctional alternatives have crept into the tradition. Those first-century Jews who failed to recognize God's purposes in Jesus the Messiah began seeking alternative methods to obtain forgiveness. The rabbinic movement filled the vacuum left by a demolished temple. The loss of our temple created an insoluble dilemma and required new thinking by rabbis and priestly religious leaders who had been stripped of their biblical mandate. Their actions were brilliant, but their actions did not solve the sin problem left behind by the system's dissolution. And the original purposes of the temple and the altar were eradicated by the inventors of the new Judaism that followed. This conclusion is not exclusively my viewpoint. One of the world's leading scholars on the writings of ancient Judaism and those of the rabbinic world presents a compelling, qualified, parallel argument. George Nicholsburg has been at the forefront of scholarship on Second Temple Judaism for more than 30 years. No one knows this literature better than George Nicholsburg, and no one is more judicious in evaluating the scholarly literature. Nicholsburg wrote, As the rabbis transformed Judaism into a religion of the Torah that excluded the necessity of a temple, the story of the destruction of the temple became less relevant as did the late first century apocalypses that fell out of use among the Jews. By the third century, the leading rabbis were effective in gathering a consensus among the Jewish people, looking for some sense of continuity. The rabbis developed new strategies, new doctrines, and new bloodless traditions that fail the biblical test for sin's atonement. Although many Modern Jews resent the need of a sacrificial system. It was the methodology ordained by God, decreed through Moses and practiced through the time of Jesus. Nonetheless, it is ignored by most modern Jews. Some have forgotten that there are certainly more ancient non-rabbinic representations of Judaism that exist which do differ significantly. And I will present a few reminders. I'll start by asking, is old school Judaism on display today? You know, rabbinic Jews are not the oldest sect of practicing Jews. Did you know that one lonely group of Jews in Israel have been faithfully expressing their holy dedication to the words of Moses for 3,600 years? These Jews follow the most important mosaic requirement detailed in Exodus in a very literal manner. Therefore, their practice of Judaism is radically different than the form observed by rabbinic Jews. 
the Samaritan Jews of Shechem, known as Nablus in modern-day Israel, have maintained parts of the most ancient Jewish traditions. One pristine example of this continuity can be seen in the interesting rituals of Samaritan Jews during the season of Passover. This is a controversial issue that provides a relevant perspective. I came in contact with the writings of a great Jewish scholar, Chaim Shaus, during my early graduate work at Spertus Institute of Jewish Studies in Chicago. I believe you'll find his comments to be informative. He suggested there are, however, in our own day, groups of Jews that never came in contact with the masses of the Jewish folk. They, therefore, observe Pesach, Passover, exactly as it was observed two to three thousand years ago. Such Jews are the Samaritans of the city of Naples. So I ask then, do some Jews still practice animal sacrifices? Well, this may shock many readers, many listeners, and it surprised me, I have to say, while still a young grad student. Nevertheless, the practice of offering sacrifices within Judaism is not completely forgotten. The sacrifice continues as an important aspect of Samaritan tradition and religious practice. Samaritans observe Pesach to this day on Mount Gerizim in a manner that other Jews ceased practicing thousands of years ago. The custom of offering sacrifices has died out with the Samaritans, except on the 14th day of Nisan, when they offer the ceremonial Pesach sacrifice. The Samaritans studied the Mosaic instructions about the annual sacrifice of a Passover lamb, and they continued to obey Moses on this important sacrificial matter. For their Seder, the Samaritan families assemble on their mountaintop, selected sheep are sacrificed by the sacerdotal leaders, and then baked in a covered pit. The pit is opened to the chanting of psalms, and each family then holds its feast, eating the offering on pieces of matzah while standing in literal reenactment of the hasty departure and flight from Egypt. I agree with the conclusion presented by the aforementioned scholar. He said, the closest approximation of a Passover ceremony in biblical times is the Seder held each year by the Samaritans on the stony top of Mount Gerizim. The Samaritans claim unbroken descent from the family of the high priest Aaron, but because of an ancient schism, they were not admitted as Jews by the temple authorities. It's crazy to me how there are different groups of Jews all over the place. We're out of time for this episode, but come back for the next one because we'll talk about the different groups of Jews from Ethiopia called the Falashas. In the meantime, I highly recommend that you follow us on social media and you can look for us with the handle at Crosstalk TV. We post encouragement there on a regular basis and you don't want to miss it. Also, if you'd like a copy of this book, which the series is based on, well, head on over to crosstalk.org to order your copy or you can get a free PDF download. Until next time, Shalom and God bless.